Thank you very much for having us. We're very excited to be here, and it's great to see so many people. Um, so I guess, as Ibrahim said, our, our format is sort of, the first part is, I guess I think of it as sort of a story time. Um, so there's been a lot in the news, especially in the last six months or so, as we've gone through the Higgs boson discovery process. And, and that's something that we were both at CERN for. Um, I've been there for a couple of years, and Jens has been there for ages. A long time. <laughs> Too long. Yeah. Um, and so I guess our purpose to, to come talk to you today is to speak a little bit informally with you, just um, but tell you about what it was like to be there, um, because it was actually a really, really interesting process to go through a discovery like this. Um, maybe teach you a little bit of science if we can sneak it in between the edges, and then answer whichever questions you have for us. Um, so that having been said, um, if you have questions as we go, please feel free to interrupt, because every once in a while we, we, we can slip into jargon, and it's best if, if, if you catch us when we're doing that. Um, so with that, I'll begin. So the place that I want to start is in 1963, actually, which was when the Higgs boson was first theorized by Peter Higgs and a handful of other theorists who were just a little bit less lucky in getting their name uh, tacked onto the boson. And, and, the, and that's really what it is. Um, but there was this, uh, they were looking at what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is a collection of theories that describe all the particles that we know about and the way that they interact, their masses, their couplings with one another, things like this. Um, and one of the things about the standard model that was a major flaw in the model uh, at the time, and this is what the Higgs boson solves, is that there's no mechanism in the standard model for particles to have mass. We all know that particles have mass. Moreover, if they didn't, then nothing would work properly. And so what Higgs and his, um, and his uh, uh, contemporaries were able to do was to do a manipulation of the equations, basically a change of variables um, that introduced a mass term to the, to the equations of the standard model and therefore sort of endowed all the particles with mass. Um, and the, the term that allows you to do this introduces what we call the Higgs field, which is a field, uh, sort of like an electromagnetic field is one type of field, or an electroweak field is another less known type of field. Um, and the Higgs field permeates sort of all of space time. And as particles travel through it, they interact with it. And that's how they pick up mass. And so when we have um, fields like this, one of the things that we know about them is that they have to be conveyed uh, by particles. And so the particle that's corresponding to the Higgs field is the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is now on the scene in 1963, and the question is, can we discover it? So um, when I say discover the Higgs boson, what I mean is a very specific thing, um, which is that uh, what we do is we don't discover, well, actually, let's, let's start with CERN. Um, can, you, can you pull up the slide of CERN? Oh. So, thanks. Sorry. So um, let me step back a moment. Um, so we're experimental particle, particle physicists. Uh, so what we do is we try to create the particles that we're looking for in uh, high energy particle collisions. Um, what do you want? Um, the uh, the circles. Oh. Yeah, that one. Thanks. Um, so what we do is we have a particle accelerator. It's 27 kilometers. It uh, runs along the French-Swiss border outside of Geneva. And we run, we run protons through the accelerator in two different directions. It's a ring. And at four points around the periphery of the ring, uh, the protons will actually collide with each other. And we create all kinds of uh, well, new things that we're trying to study. So um, underground at the different locations, uh, we then let me draw a picture for you here. If the accelerator is sort of going in a ring like this, we have four interaction points around the detector where, where the beams come into collision. And then what we do is we're part of a collaboration where we build a detector basically around the collision point so that we can detect the particles that come out of the collision. So it's a cylindrical detector, sort of encompasses the collision point like this, and we call it Atlas. Now we have com some compatriots across the ring on the other side, which are our competitors, but in a friendly way, called CMS. And they will figure prominently in the story. Um, so just very briefly, uh, when we're searching for a new particle, uh, what we're actually looking for is not the particle itself, but for the particles that it decays into. So for something like the Higgs boson, it only lives for a fraction of a second and then breaks apart into other particles. Sometimes those particles then break apart into still more particles. And so what you need to do is you actually get 
sprays of particles that come out from the collision point, and then you detect them as they traverse your detector. Um, and from that, you kind of reverse engineer the Higgs boson. So what you're looking for is for excesses of events in these specific uh, decay branches. And once you see enough of them, then you say, OK, it looks like there's, there's indications in this particular decay channel that there's a particle here. And then once you reach a certain statistical confidence in that statement, you can say we've discovered a new particle. Uh, could you pull up the branching fractions that we had up just a moment ago? Thank you. So there are three um, decay modes of the Higgs that are really important for this talk today. Um, so what this is showing is basically the different ways that the Higgs boson can decay. And I'll just point out a couple, um, a couple of these to you that are the most important. It can decay in any one of these different channels. Um, but for our story today, the most important ones are WW, it's this green line, ZZ, and Gamma Gamma, this purple one down here. So let me point out a couple of things to you that are, that are important about these. And this is the reason why it was, it was, these are the reasons why these are so important. Um, so ZZ, start with ZZ. As it happens, the Higgs is at 125. So ZZ, you have a pretty good branching fraction of maybe 30%. ZZ is really nice because it's a very clean uh, channel. You can de detect all of the uh, decay products that are coming out of the Higgs collision. Um, and it's a very low background channel. So this is a, a, a channel where you can actually make a discovery with dozens of events, which is really nice. Um, gamma gamma is also very clean. We can pick up both gamma rays um, in our detector. Um, so that's really nice. And we can completely reconstruct the Higgs. A little bit higher background, um, but still relatively low background compared to some of the other ones. The problem with gamma gamma is look how low the branching fraction is. Only one out of 1,000 Higgs bosons decays to gamma gamma. Um, and when you're only producing something like a few Higgs bosons every hour, this might not be all that many events. You have to collect lots and lots of data to be able to see enough of them in gamma gamma. And then WW is a really nice uh, channel because it has this nice high branching fraction, um, up even to 100%, depending on what the mass of the Higgs is. Um, but the thing about WW is that when the Ws decay in our detector, um, one of the particles that they decay to is a neutrino, which is basically impossible for us to detect. Um, and you need specialized detectors to, to see them. And so what this means is that you can't completely reconstruct the W because you're missing one of the particles that you would need to reconstruct it. And so you get kind of fuzzy blobs where you had Ws. And then when you take your, w, your Ws, add them together, try to get Higgs, you get kind of a fuzzy blob. Um, but these are the three channels that we have to work with to make a discovery. So now I'm going to fast forward to 2011. Uh, so the Higgs, the, Question. yes. Is there a significance behind the names of those channels? Yes, so these are um, the particles that the Higgs is decaying to. So gamma gamma is two photons, and WW and ZZ are just different kinds of particles they can decay to. Yeah. Um, and so the, right, so then let's fast forward to 2011. So at this point, the LHC has been on for a couple of years, and the LHC sort of the, there's a two-fold purpose to it, I would say, to first order. The first is to look for any kind of physics beyond the standard model. Um, and second, and, and maybe, or maybe even first, depending on how you want to order these things, is to find the Higgs boson. So the, the, the real focus of the, the collaboration at this point is to find the Higgs boson. And there are hundreds of people who are working on the different decay channels, looking for excesses in each of their channels. Um, and in 2011, I had just been at CERN for a couple weeks, and it was a very interesting weekend. Um, it was Easter weekend, actually. And so it was the Thursday before Easter weekend. And so everyone's kind of, they're starting to go home. People are ready to have a four-day weekend. And there's an email that goes out um, that there's a group, there's a, a small group of people, three or four people, who've been analyzing some data independently on their own, not part of one of the, the major efforts, but sort of as, as a, a, a project that they're doing independently. And they see an excess in one of the channels. So this is big news. Um, and so what's going on here is, is a little bit of skiing off piste, I think. They weren't doing anything that was inappropriate. Um, but at the same time, uh, they're not, now all of a sudden, the, the collaboration is really focused on what's going on in this channel. And might this be actually a discovery? One of the things that was really intriguing about it also was that the mass point that they happened to be seeing an excess at was a place where there had been a little bit of an interesting excess on a previous experiment um, before that experiment was closed down. So maybe this is corroborating proof of something that we already had a hint at before. Um, and then something, something uh, very dramatic happened, which was 
uh, this internal document telling about this, this hint that they had seen was posted to a blog. And we still don't know who did it. Um, but this was actually a big problem because it puts a lot of, um, uh, a pu it puts a lot of pressure on us to then very quickly figure out what's going on and not work in our very, our, our usual comfort zone, which is very slow and deliberate. And so as it turns out, uh, this was a false alarm. It took a couple weeks of truly working around the clock to figure this out. But we learned something very important from this experience, which was that we had to be very careful about what we said, because as soon as anyone said Higgs in public, a lot of eyes all of a sudden came onto CERN. And so we wanted to be very sure that we knew what to say when they started asking us questions. So, so we continued to run the detector. We continued to collect more data. Um, and in general, the more data that you have, the more confidence you can have when in detecting a particle. Um, and then I, there was a, there's a round of conferences that come around in the winter. Before those conferences, we wanted to have sort of an, a status update on the Higgs boson search. And so this was too early for us to say that, that we thought that there was anything, there wasn't enough data that we would be able to say anything definitive anyway, but just to give a status update. And there was a little nudge in the most interesting channels at 125 or so GeV. So that's right at this point here. Now I'll just stop for a second to point something out to you, which is that 125 is actually really nice. Because if you take a, uh, a, you draw a vertical line at 125, you hit all of these lines, right? So you have all of the, the decay channels that can come into play here. Whereas if you're down here or you're up here, then there's a lot less flexibility that you have for looking for it in different decay channels. But since we're looking now at 125, we have gamma gamma, we have WW, we have ZZ. So all of the major players are, are now in the game. So, but there wasn't enough um, data that we could say with great uh, confidence that we thought there was something there. We th it was something like a one in a hundred chance that it would be that what we were seeing was due to a statistical fluctuation of the data, which is simply not enough for us to say anything. The thing that was really interesting for me, personally, I remember at the time, was that CMS, which were our, our sort of our, our doppelganger on the other side of the, of the collider, they saw peaks in the same channels at the same mass. So it's not just us. If it were just us, I think people would have been much less excited. But the fact that CMS was seeing something, too, was pointing towards something that there might be something physical that's actually going on in the detectors here. So, so now I'll fast forward a little bit further, about six months, to June of 2012. Um, so we're working our way up to the, f yes. Um, the soft, everything is basically as independent as can be. So um, let me continue to tell my story um, and then ask your question again if I haven't answered it. Because um, one of the things that's really important is sort of the interplay between the two experiments during, during the discovery process. Um, so in June of 2012, uh, there was a conference that was coming up in mid-July, and everyone knew that there was going to be a Higgs update that was given by one by Atlas and one by CMS. So at this point, we should have enough data to be able to say something fairly conclusive. Um, and the magic number that we need to be working toward is five sigma significance. This is five. So if we can reach this number, then we can say that we have a discovery. Um, and this number is, is the number that corresponds to basically there's one in a three and a half million chance that what we're seeing is due to a statistical fluctuation. So it's a, a pretty high degree of certainty. And the reason that we want to do that is, like I said, because you don't want to um, have a false alarm. And because there are three sigmas and four sigmas that have come and gone. So five sigma seems to be safe. Um, and this five sigma corresponds to the combination of all the decay channels together. So maybe you see three sigma in ZZ. That's not enough. But if you see three sigma and gamma gamma also, then you can put those two together statistically. And you can say, potentially depending on how the channels are correlated, that you have five sigma overall. So five sigma is the magic number. Um, and we were at something like 2 to 2.5, I think, in December. Um, and so. So I was at a, at a summer conference in, um, in France with a bunch of my friends. And, and some of them are on CMS, and some of us are on Atlas. And this is, this is one place where this is, this, is, this is something we shouldn't have done, but we were excited enough that we did it anyway, um, which was that I, as an Atlas member, saw some of the CMS data. So what CMS had been doing, um, and this is what Atlas does too, is they blind their data. So they specifically look, they specifically set aside the data where they think the signal 
might be hiding, and they look in sidebands or control regions to optimize the entire analysis. And only once that's complete, do they unblind and finally look for the particle. And the reason that we do that is because we don't want to bias ourselves and accidentally get excited by something that we see in the data and then amplify it um, and, and sort of bias ourselves that way. And so CMS was unblinding. And so there was this big call, which had 300 people on the line, and we were all dialed in, and we were huddled around an iPhone looking to see what the CMS results were. And the CMS results looked really, really good. It was really, really exciting. Um, and so, so we knew that if CMS was seeing something that was this good, then Atlas should be too. And sure enough, the next week, Atlas unblinded their gamma gamma, and it looked really good. It was something like three and a half sigma. And then analogously in ZZ, now ZZ is starting to come online a couple weeks later, and ZZ now sees something like two and a half sigma. So at this point, um, and, and this is the last that I heard of the CMS results until the 4th of July. So there is some bleeding in between the two of them, but we try very hard, especially at this point, to partition the two collaborations so that the excitement of one doesn't sort of amplify the efforts of the other. Um, so, so, so now the race is on um, to try to get the results for the conference in the summer. So we have a hard deadline that's in the middle of July. And uh, there was a lot of excitement uh, within CERN about what the two collaborations were seeing. And there were you know, rumors that were flying back and forth a little bit. And so the director general of CERN then called a meeting uh, in late June between the spokesperson of Atlas, the spokesperson of CMS, and the director general of CERN, um, in which the spokespersons sort of tipped their hands to one another. And this was by agreement, um, and, and to the director general, and said, this is what we see so far. Um, and, and at this point, the director general of CERN says this looks this looks like it will probably be good enough that I think we want to have an announcement that's coming out of CERN rather than having the announcement that's coming out of this conference, which uh, last year happened to be in Australia, um, because we we kind of feel a little bit of possession, I guess, of this discovery and we want it to be ours to give to the world as sort of from our own home. So this was taken as a very good sign that all of a sudden. There's now a special seminar that's been planned at CERN for the 4th of July. And this, at this point, is several weeks in the future. Um, and so the question is, what are you going to be able to get done before the 4th of July? So at this point, we have, um, we have this, the accelerator, as it happens, is running really, really well. And we're getting lots and lots of data every day. Um, and we need every bit of data that we have to be able to get enough confidence in these channels that maybe we can combine them and get the magic number, we can get the five sigma. And usually, um, as the data comes in, we have to do a round of processing on it, basically, in calibrations and make sure that there was nothing wrong with the detector conditions when it was taken. And there's this whole uh, rigmarole that the data gets put through. And it usually takes something like a couple months. And so at this point, there's this massive uh, mobilization at CERN to bring dozens and dozens of people online from whatever they're working on to start working on the data processing so that we can get the data out in a matter of days and weeks instead of in weeks or months. And it was really magnificent to see this big effort kind of come out of CERN because we had to, we had to get all this data just through as fast as we could. And they did it. They added it in really, really. It's a, it, was, it was magnificent to see how fast they were adding in the data. They were taking it, taking it one week, and it was in a plot the next week. And that's absolutely unheard of. So, so we're getting more and more data every day. Um, the numbers are being updated more and more and more every day. Um, the reason I say this is because I, I wish I could tell you exact numbers and like bring you through the, the progression in numbers as we were watching the significance of these channels grow. Um, but it was, it was hard to keep track, honestly, at this point. Every day, there's a new number coming in, depending on which channel it is, which data set they're using. Everything's looking really good. Um, and so there's, there's one channel that I haven't mentioned in a little while, and it's WW. WW is also in play. Um, but WW had yet to unblind. Um, because they, they had been a little bit behind the curve because they hadn't gotten some uh, data sets as, as soon as they needed them. And so it was only five or six days before the July 4th uh, announcement that we know is coming. And so the question is what to do with WW. So the decision was made um, that they would, they would talk about unblinding WW, try to decide whether they um, were ready to look at the data yet in the signal region. Um, but before they did the, the unblinding deliberation, they had to decide whether they were going to include WW in the combination. So is this channel, regardless of what we do, and, and we know personally amongst ourselves, is this something that we're going to be ready to tell the world about on the 4th of July? And the decision was that it should not be included in the, uh, in the final calibration, because there was simply not enough time 
to do all the checks that you would want to do in those four or five days before the, before the seminar. And you have to be extremely careful here, because this is, this is where some of those lessons that we learned the first time around come into play. Um, that if, you, if you, uh, you, you get too aggressive with WW and you include it, because it looks really, you, you unblind it, you say, oh, this looks really good, let's include it. But you haven't done all your checks, maybe there's a problem and you've accidentally just discovered a particle that isn't really there. Um, likewise, let's say you unblind it and there's a, there's a different kind of problem and WW actually sees less than they should. Well then, let's say you were at five sigma before and now you add in WW and you've taken yourself down to 4.5. So you've just undiscovered a particle. You really want to know what's going on with WW. And, and, and the, de the decision was, we just, we're not confident that we can do all those checks we need to do. So WW, this is now the Wednesday before, this is six days before the, the announcement. They make the decision to unblind WW, but it's going to stay within the collaboration, and it's not going to be included on the 4th of July. And so this is where the story diverges a little bit in an interesting way, because now there are two different, there are two different things that, are, that we need to keep track of. One is what's going to be included on the 4th of July, what we're going to be able to tell everyone, whether we can say, you know, the, the Higgs boson has been discovered. And then the other one is sort of what we privately know as, as collaborators and as, as people who are privy to this information, whether we know that the Higgs boson has been discovered. So let's say that we, we only have 4.2 sigma on the 4th of July, but we know that WW is waiting in the wings, and WW has 3 sigma, and that's going to push over the threshold. So at that point, we can't say we've discovered the Higgs boson, but like, let's be honest, we're going to know for ourselves whether we've discovered the Higgs boson. So, so this, was, this Wednesday afternoon was really, really exciting, actually, when they, they unblinded WW at about noon. And so that afternoon, you're just kind of sitting there. You're like, I'm pretty sure they're discovering a new particle right now. Like, that's, that's really neat. Um, and so the next day, uh, the, the unblinding had finished running. There was a, an official talk to be given on Friday. So this is four days before the, before the announcement. Um, but the rumors started to go around. And... Um, and so they, they said that they had, they had unblinded and it, it looked really good. So I was saying, oh, like, we, we should have put it in. Like, we should have put it in. Um, and at the same time, so, so regardless of, of what we can say on, on the next week, like, we've, we found it. Like, this, this is it. So, so now the issue is what are we going to be able to say next week? Um, and so th what, what, what's happening now is that you need to look at um, you need to look at the updates to the Gamma Gamma. You need to look at the ZZ. You have a little bit of information from last year's analyses that you can mix in, but like Gamma Gamma and, and, and ZZ are the powerhouse channels. And so it's just an issue of like putting those together and seeing if you have the magic number. And um, so I have, I have a particularly well-connected friend at CERN, or maybe she was just in the right meeting. I don't know. And so we were eating lunch with her on Thursday. And, uh, and we were all gossiping about this because, of course, that's... I mean, <laughs> because of course we're gossiping about this. And uh, so one of my friends kind of leans in. He's very, we're speaking very quietly because it's a cafeteria that's 50% Alice and 50% uh, CMS. And, <laughs> and, you know, if you want to learn secrets at CERN, like just go sit in the cafeteria and listen for somebody who's too, too noisy. And, um, and so one of my friends, she said, they've, they've done the global combination. Like they know what the number is for next week. They're going to have it in a meeting tomorrow. But, you know, if you know the right people, you can, you can find out today. And so, so one of my friends kind of leans in. He's like, how many sigma do they have? And she goes, <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of catches herself. But so, so at this point, this point, this point you, you know it's in the bag, right? We know it for ourselves because we have the WW. Like, if the WW had been mixed in at that point, it's like, I don't even know, 6.5 sigma or something. We're fine. Um, but not only that, but we get to tell everyone. So, so this, is, this is perfect. Um, at the same time, uh, the question is, what does CMS have? Because I'm pretty sure that there's a Higgs boson at this point. The question is just, and, and if there's a Higgs boson, if we can see it, they can see it. And so now, now the, the competition comes into it back again a little bit. Um, because, okay, so we have five sigma, but, but what do they have? Do they have six sigma? I hope they don't have six sigma because I want to find it. Um, so, so even though we sort of had all the physics cards on the table, um, there was still this, even, even up until the morning of July the 4th, there was, there was still reason to go to the seminar because you only have half the story and you want to see what the other guy has. So, so we go to the talk the next day and 
www looks pretty good, but they're not going to be including it. They need to run some more checks, and it's going to be out in a couple of weeks. Um, they do the, the global fit, and it's 5.1 sigma, I think something like that. Um, and, uh, and we all go home, and we have like a, a quiet weekend. And, but it's, it's, it's a really cool time, right, because you know, like, you know that it's going to be a big deal in like three days, and there's, there's 5,000 people in the world who know this, and you're one of them. You're just, oh, this is going to be so great. Um, so, so the word, the word had sort of started sneaking out at this point. There were people there, you know, Peter Higgs had been, had been called a few weeks before and they said, you probably shouldn't plan any vacation for early July. We might need you to come, <laughs> we, we need you to come visit CERN. So, so now people were seeing Peter CERN and the, or, or Peter, Peter Higgs in the CERN cafeteria. And then this is, this is a very promising sign. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so there's this announcement that's going to be made on, on the 4th of July. And everybody wants a seat in the seminar room. And the seminar room holds, I don't know, it, it's reasonably, but it's not huge. It's 500 people, maybe 300 people. And half of those seats are going to go to people who funded the experiment and the, the higher-ups on the, on, the, um, on the collaborations, as they should. Um, but there's you know, a fraction of this, this small space is going to be reserved for the, the schmucks like us. Um, and we had we had learned our lesson from the December talk because the December talks the seats were hard to come by and we had showed out four hours early for that. Is this the point at which I should bring up another picture? Yeah, when you start bringing up pictures, we have a a, a bunch of pictures. Jens and I were both at this talk, <laughs> so so there's Jens sitting there on the floor for um, hours, I'm sure. Um, and we just slept there the night before. Honestly, they locked the they locked the doors of the seminar room because they knew that people like us were going to do this. Um, <laughs> And so we all lined up in the hallways, and, and we, watched, uh, we watched The Lion King, and we tried to sleep, and got very excited, and read internal notes, because we wanted to look at all the plots again, because they look so great. I um, should stress here that this was at 5 a.m., where people came in thinking they were early enough to get into the auditorium. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what they were thinking. I think the latest you could get there, if they get a seat, was 4.30, maybe. Um, and uh, so then the seminar starts. And, and we're all like trying to stay awake, actually, because we've been up all night. Um, and, uh, and the CMS talk goes first. And the, the CMS talk actually was really interesting, because CMS um, had done slightly better than Atlas in the respect that they had more data in more channels that was ready. So like their WW was more updated than ours, for example. And uh, CMS, they, they got up to, if they did the, 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 the global combination um, with all of all of their channels minus one, I think. They got to 5.1 sigma. And then they had a little bit of a downward fluctuation in, the, in this last channel. And it bumped them down to 4.9. And I was just like, oh. But I mean, 4.9. 4. I mean, come on. You, you discovered a particle. Um, but I thought, that was, I thought that was interesting, just because this is a case of where you, know, you can get a little bit unlucky. And you know, like I said, 4.9, you're fine. But, um, but they, they did happen to get a little bit unlucky there. And, uh, and then Atlas does a second presentation, which of course is less of a surprise because we've we've seen all the slides already. Um, and but we're, as it happens, able to to say the magic words of five sigma. And of course, if you were to put Atlas and CMS together, I mean, you'd be at I don't even know like eight sigma or something. Like there's no doubt at this point. Um, Atlas was just a little bit lucky in that we got to, like I said, say the magic words. Um, and uh, it was very exciting because I think the. Especially being able, to, like crossing that five sigma threshold was really uh, meaningful, I think. And there was there was a big round of applause, especially for Atlas that I remember. I think CMS definitely got one too, but I, I particularly remember the Atlas one because it went on forever, <laughs> like just for like four minutes of just like this is starting to get ridiculous, guys. Um, and uh, and so the, and there were there was it was it was all very nice with uh, congratulations from all over the world, and Mr. Higgs was there and. Um, you know, may or may not have wiped a tear from his eye um, at, at the moment that they flashed up the slide, and and uh, and it was it was it was really great. Um, <laughs> so so in the afternoon, um, we're all kind of exhausted, and some of us went home for naps. Uh, the the ones who had a little bit more stamina stuck around for the free champagne, um, and um, and then. And, it, and then there's, there's a series more of, of, of additional studies that we, we had to do at this point. Um, I mean, the big discoveries made, this is sort of the exciting part is now coming to an end a little bit. But um, one thing that I want to 
spend just a moment talking about now and sort of gesture towards the future is like, okay, so we found a particle, now what? Um, and the first series of questions that had to be answered was, is it the Higgs boson? Because it looks like a Higgs boson and it seems about right, but you need to do something like, you need to do things like measure all of these branching fractions. Um, you need to do things like measure the spin of the particle, which is just one of its quantum mechanical properties. But if it has the wrong spin, it's not a Higgs boson. Um, it's something else, and it's maybe even more interesting. So there were a series of studies that then had to be that had to be done. So we we certainly partied on the Fourth of July, but we were back at work on the Fifth of July trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and they finally wrapped up those studies, uh, at least the first round of them, enough that a couple weeks ago um, at the Morion conferences, which is another set of conferences. Um, that they have in, in March, they were able to say definitively this is a Higgs boson. Um, so, now, so now we can say things like we found the Higgs. Um, but there's still a lot more that, uh, that they're trying to find. So um, I think the, I'll take the last few minutes here just to, to gesture towards what we're, we're looking at in the future um, as far as things like the Higgs is, is concerned. Um, and that is something like looking for additional Higgs bosons. Um, and the reason that I bring this up in particular is because it's something that I work on. Uh, this is my thesis topic, is looking for um, uh, under certain classes of, of theories that go beyond the standard model. So these are the kinds of theories that we're most interested in investigating. Um, there's not just one Higgs boson, but there's five. And so it's my job to find the second one. Um, and so there's a, a number of different efforts um, on, on these sorts of fronts that now we have this great new toy that we can play with and try to crack open the standard model a little bit more. Um, and so that's, that's just one gesture towards some of the uh, additional things that we'll be doing at CERN. Um, so technologically, uh, just very briefly, I'll bring in Jens to say a couple things about, um, yeah, well just, just a couple minutes. Um, and then I think we'll be ready for questions just in a minute or two. Um, so the uh, CERN right now is at a little bit of a, uh, it's at an interesting point. We've stopped taking data. The whole goal was to find the Higgs boson and run one, and we've done that. Um, and now what we're doing is upgrading and repairing parts of the accelerator and upgrading and repairing parts of the detector. So there actually won't be a whole lot of new data being taken at CERN for the next two years. But the, phys the data analysis of the data that we've already collected will be continuing for the next two years. And so hopefully there will be a couple more surprises to find in there. This is something that Jens is particularly involved in. So Jens, do you want to say a couple I, words about what they're doing? I don't really want to say much. I mostly came here to show pictures. <laughs> um, so what Katie has not shown you is pictures. And I encourage everyone, because you're in Zurich, in particular the people in the room are in Zurich, uh, get over there and get downstairs. We have a long shutdown now for two years. Um, the caverns are open. So if you're interested, you can just sign up for a visit at CERN and go about 100 meters underground and see the experiments. Um, there's, you should look at CERN.ch, and then you'll probably find something like visits or uh, how to get talk, there. Or, talk, to, talk to us. Or we talk can, to us. Yeah. yeah. Say again? Yeah. Well, you can come as a group. Um, for, for typical underground visits, we're limited to 12 persons per visit, which is about 45 minutes. So if you're coming in with 500 people, then better plan for a long week. Ah, yes, of course. So okay, the question so the was question how to get you, underground. The question here in the room was how to visit and how to get underground. Okay. Uh, um, um, yeah, but, but there's there's ways through the CERN visit service that they can uh, do these arrangements. Uh, yeah. To to give an outline, we have about eighty thousand visitors per year, and that's only the number that we know of. We like people like Katie and I. We typically get our family there, our friends there, or whatever, and we guide them around, and that's not included in the official numbers. So we we're talking about a little more than a hundred thousand visitors per year. That does not include certain open days, which will happen, for example, in September, I think, this year, which is where we have two days on a weekend, which are open, one for the families and friends of CERN people, and one for the general public, which has another 80,000 visitors in two days. So that's roughly what we're talking about. Um, what you get to see at CERN is things like this, and I cannot really point at it, but maybe Katie Here, can point at it. Here, let me take the, the laser. Okay. Okay, I'll take laser. 
So what you get to see on the ground is pretty large structures. The photos that I took here are partially from 2007, 2008, when the cavern was still empty, which you see here, because big structures there's are missing. There's a gap here, for um, example. Yeah. There's, there's a large gap. What we do is we build really large detectors on the ground, and they fill the caverns. In case of Atlas, we build it underground. That means we're, we're bringing parts down and building like a ship in a bottle, basically. Whereas CMS builds everything upstairs and then brings it down in nine, brought it down in nine slices. The central slice being about 3,000 tons and being lowered 100 meters. They rented a shipyard crane for this. <laughs> um, the biggest structures at Atlas had, you're going to see in one of those pictures, is 280 ton magnets. Um, which are 11 meters in diameter, but the hall above the surface is roughly 11 meters high, and the crane's inside the hall. So if you want to attach the crane to the structure, you have to lower the structure halfway into the hole and then attach the crane. That was funny moments back in 2007. Um, as you might realize, Katie does data analysis while I do hardware. So I, typic I typically have good photographs. She has better plots. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're going to get to some plots, too, because we have some, some that might explain how discovery works. This is the structure I was talking about. That's an 11-meter diameter magnet, so the thing that looks uh, metallic in the center, supported by this orange, stru orange structure, it can slide into the detector. Like so so? You, can, you can actually move this. It has pneumatic feet where we put in pressure, and then it's supported like a hovercraft and can slide in. Uh, it's not as simple to move, but kind of. Um, the structure that you see aside of it, which looks like a large piece of cake, is a 22-meter muon chamber in diameter, which can also slide over. It's suspended on rails on, at the top of the cavern, and it can slide over to seal off the detector. This is Katie and another colleague from, from Great Britain. Uh, standing on a platform inside the detector. Um, to give you an impression, we have 11 stories on the C side of our detector. There's a C and an A side. The A side has 12 stories inside the cavern. Um, you get to climb up four floors to be where we were standing at that time uh, through detector material. So you, you're climbing between active detectors. And in this particular case, you're standing next to a 1,000 ton calorimeter that's filled with liquid argon gas. So we have about 90,000 liters yeah. of liquid nitrogen, 40,000 liters of liquid argon in this cavern, and it's a very particular feeling if you're down there. <laughs> I think Katie enjoyed the day very much. I, I did. It's like, it's like a big like radioactive detector treehouse. It's really great. <laughs> The first time I was there was in summer 2006. I keep getting back there whenever I can because it's the greatest place on Earth. <laughs> um, this is when we transported the part that I worked on at the time. This was lowering uh, a four kilogram detector itself with lots of support structure, which had to be inserted as a very last component into the center of the detector. Um, the transportation effort alone was complicated as such because we couldn't we couldn't crash it anywhere. We couldn't just roll it over to the cavern and then attach it to the crane because it had to be suspended such that it wouldn't suffer from shocks during the transport. So we couldn't just roll it over. It was craned over from one hall into the other. Also, we had only a half an hour window where the weather forecast was good enough to get it over without it being drowned in rain. Right. So just for a sense of scale, let me just jump in here for a second because I, I just learned this recently and I think it's really cool. So you have a sense now that the detector is the size of a large building, um, but the alignment of the components within the detector is known to the width of a few human hairs. Um, so it's, it's very large, but it's very precisely aligned. And so if you have something like you roll over a pebble wrong, um, then it can mess up that alignment. That's why we have to be so careful in the installation. should probably take questions in a few s pictures. But. We're almost there. Okay. So this is where it arrived, but I mean, we're done. Uh, OK, perfect. <laughs> OK. We, we overspoke a little bit, but, but it's, we get carried away. So uh, if you want sequel results, we do actually have sequel results, because physicists typically focus on getting data analyzed and then getting papers out. Um, making this easy to understand for general public is a tough job and takes a lot of time that we need to 
like make time for that. Like that's that's our weekend. So I suppose that someone messed up his weekend when generating yeah. animated but, gifs like this. Right. So this is well, we can just let this play in the background, but let me just introduce you to it before I take a couple thoughts. So this is the ZZ. Um, and so on the uh, what you're looking for is you're looking for an excess of events that's not explained by basically these colored structures. So the colored structure is the background Monte Carlos. This is our model of what a background will look like in this channel. On this axis here is the reconstructed mass of the Higgs. So if you start to see a bump, then that's the mass of, of the particle that you're looking for. And so what this is doing is it's scrolling through time and it's adding more and more data to the histogram. And so you can start to see that there's, yeah, if you can reset it, that um, there will be a, uh, a peak that'll start to emerge right here that isn't apparent from sort of the, the red uh, background. And so once you start to see a peak that isn't explained by any of the backgrounds, then that's what has to be a signal. So this is actually watching the, where the points here are the data, actually watching the, uh, the Higgs peak grow in real time. And then at some point, it'll zoom in on this exact excess and then fill in the Higgs underneath it with uh, sort of the, the signal Monte Carlo, say like this is, that's what a Higgs would look like. Okay, I think with that, we've, we've overspoken by it probably 10 minutes or so. Um, but 15 minutes for questions? As many questions as you, as you can ask in 15 minutes. Yeah. But thank you very much for your attention. It's been a lot of fun. We hope you've learned something. This topic or anything else, really. We're, we're young. We answer questions most of the time. <laughs> The, uh, they were understanding. The they, oh, sorry. The question was, uh, what did the uh, Australian conference think about the their their thunder being slightly stolen? I think they understood. Um, they they could see that it was maybe going to come. I I can't imagine they were that happy because you know it'd be great if you can be the person who makes the the announcement. But um, but we did have a direct line to Melbourne for the seminar, and so a lot of our colleagues were in Australia at that point for the for the conference, which was starting the next day. And so they called in and, and they congratulated us very nicely. So um, I mean, and the people who were organizing the conference were the people who were a subset of the people who made the discovery. So um, it was a very collegial feeling. How big is the next accelerator? I, I prepared Jens should a take picture for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, the question was size of the next machine that we're building. Um, we are not we are not building the next machine yet. We're thinking about building next machines and well, upgrading the machine that we currently have, which you see on this picture in white. That's the LHC. That's nine kilometers in diameter, 27 kilometers in circumference. Um, we're thinking about upgrading that sometime in 2022, maybe, up, running up to 2030. That's going to deliver a lot of data to exclude a lot of things that we're... Or discover we, a lot of things. Well, we're, we're mostly excluding. <laughs> we have many more ideas we're, than we have actual particles that we found. Very but, exclusive. Yeah. Um, but then the thing is, we need a precision machine. So what the LHC is, is a thing that com collides protons. Protons are particle combinations of multiple quarks. And so we never know how much energy we actually get in a collision, because what's colliding is not the proton, but the quarks. So depending on how much fraction of momentum of the total proton one of the quarks has as they collide, um, you get more or less boost in one direction. What we used to have in the past, and what we should have again in the far away future, kind of, on, a, on my lifetime span measured, um, or hers, is uh, an electron-positron collider, because those are fundamental particles. They're not made up of other structures, as far as we know. So what we got in the large electron-positron collider previously was collisions where we could adjust the energy of the incident particles and thereby create a collision at a fixed energy. We would never get something else but the energy that we put in, because as the two particles collide, they disappear completely. So all of their momentum goes into the collision. 
And using those machines, you can much more precisely measure the outcome. Um, the energy we need to properly measure Higgs bosons, you can roughly grasp from the scales that are shown in this picture, is 500 GeV center of mass is nice. That is because we can most probably uh, create Higgs bosons only in associations with Z bosons. And that means we need to get up to an energy of 240 GeV instead of 125 to, to create both particles and make them detectable. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is produce some very heavy quarks in pairs and measure them precisely. So producing top quarks in pairs requires some 340, 350 GeV of center of mass energy. So that's the rough scale we want to go to. And then you want to be able to go slightly beyond just to like measure the full spectrum and not just end exactly where you want to measure. Um, there are also plans for building something like a compact linear collider and not just the standard international linear collider. The standard concept is the one shown in yellow that's like 30 kilometers long in a straight line. The other concept is the compact linear collider that's in light blue that's 42 kilometers. It's only compact because it has a lot more energy in the same length. Right. I should say very quickly too, uh, one of the things that's tricky about electrons and positrons, they give you very nice clean collisions and they're very tunable. The thing is, is when you try to run them in circles, they radiate away their energy. And if you were to put electrons into the LHC, they would radiate away as much energy in a turn as you could put back in through the accelerator. So uh, the way that we avoid this problem is by not turning them. Um, so that's why you want to build a linear collider, but that's technically more difficult. So that's what motivates the, the, the geometry there. Linear collider geometry is, is the problem. As you see from the size of the structures, it's kind of hard to find a place where you can actually drill a tunnel that's this long. You want to typically build a tunnel such that it's easier to control access, such that you don't have radiation at the far ends that comes out and like disturbs people, which it does. Yeah. So that's, that's why we generally put structures on the ground. Um, Japan is thinking about uh, looking into that. Uh, that's the time scale for this is roughly 2030. And then there's other ideas around. We're, we're not very fond of just having one idea. So this here, I zoomed out, is ideas for an 80 kilometer storage ring. That would actually be in the Geneva region. And either it would pass as seen on the left underneath the lake of Geneva and beyond the next mountain range that we can see from the CERN cafeteria, or it would pass into the Jura, both of which will be complicated because you're, you're going through multiple layers of different types of rock. And so drilling tunnels in there is, is kind of complicated. But then you need the pre-acceleration structures to get proper energies into these rings so that you only get here. I think I heard a question over here, maybe. So the question is whether the tunnel has to be straight or slightly can can oh, be slightly Oh, to follow the curvature the of the Earth surface. over the distance. Curvature of the Earth is not really a big deal. Um, but it would most presumably be a straight tunnel just to not deal with bending magnets. We'd have to refocus at some points, and we'd probably get some something that we call more like a kicker magnet that adjusts the beam. But it's really fixed focusing, and it's not about bending, bending the particle path. There must be a bending somewhere in there, because at the point where you want to collide the beams, you don't want to shoot the positron beam into the electron acceleration line. So at yeah. that point, you have like a one degree angle or so. Ah, the question was about the third detector. So there are four points around this ring, and the two that I haven't spoken about are LHCB and one called ALICE. Um, LHCB and ALICE are both, so CMS and ATLAS we call sort of general purpose detectors. Um, CM, uh, LHCB and ALICE are more focused on particular types of physics. So LHCB is, is there and doing wonderful physics. They focus on um, the physics of B hadrons. And the reason that B hadrons are interesting is because we're trying to understand to not to put too fine a point on it, but why the universe is made of matter instead of antimatter, because there's no 
physical reason why we should be made of matter, matter instead of antimatter. Um, and B hadrons, as it turns out, show some asymmetry between Bs and anti-Bs. And so it's a very interesting la laboratory for studying the answer to this question. And then at least just briefly, um, so while we're talking about other detectors, is designed to do heavy ions. So for a couple months every year, they take all the protons out of the LHC and they put in lead nuclei. And they smash them together to try to basically create the um, environment that existed just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, when quarks and gluons were not joined together into protons and neutrons, but were actually f sort of floating free. And this was um, obviously a very interesting laboratory for us to, to try to understand the very beginning of the universe. And that's something that Elise uh, specializes in. Yes? Uh, like, like, oh, things like black holes, risks like black holes. Um, no, just, just a quick vote in the audience, like, who's scared of black holes? I've heard of black holes. We've heard of black holes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, good. Um, is, is it clear that when we're talking about black holes in the context of the LHC, that A, we have to assume very special theories, and B, we're talking about microscopic black holes. We're not talking about the thing that eats up suns. We're, we're talking about something that's very, very tiny. In the beginning? Or In the beginning. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it does suck for a while, and then it grows bigger. No, I well, so the so to first order, uh, to first order, we're pretty sure that they wouldn't be there for. There are smarter people than me who crunch the numbers. It says we just don't have enough energy. But let's suppose we got that equation wrong, um, and we do create a microscopic black hole. There's uh, Stephen Hawking. One of the things that made that he sort of made his name theorizing was that black holes can actually evaporate, and as it happens, small ones evaporate quite quickly. So they would only live for a fraction of a second. Um, now let's suppose that Stephen Hawking is wrong, and we have a stable black hole, stable microscopic black hole that's floating around the inside of the detector. And then they 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 did a calculation of it's like it's doing a little Pac-Man through the detector and it's just gobbling up like atoms as it gets close to them, um, and like how long would it have to go before it would be like I don't know the size of an atom or something like that? And it was like millions of years. It was. So there could be one in. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that is why we can, wait, there we go. I think we promised something like wild no. and irresponsible speculation, and I'm glad you're yes. here to provide it for everyone. <laughs> Let, let's go further into wild speculations. We do know about objects like neutron stars, which are roughly the mass of the sun or two, uh, but the size uh, diameter of a kilometer. So what these feel like is um, matter in the core of an atom, the, the nucleus of an atom, just the size of one kilometer diameter. The moment a microscopic black hole would exist it would hit a neutron star and it would just be dissipated. Like the neutron star would go away that very moment. Now we know that cosmic radiation exists. We have some very fancy experiments, for example, in Argentina that has 3,000 square kilometers of Earth surface monitored for energy deposit deposition from the sky. Uh, we look into the sky with telescopes to find gamma ray bursts in the upper atmosphere. We have a South Pole telescope that monitors the cosmic microwave background. We, we have quite a few things that know that there's cosmic radiation. And we see cosmic radiation in an energy range, range that we will never reach with any accelerator that we can build on this planet because the planet's diameter is not large enough. So we have a pretty good idea that if microscopic black holes would exist and were stable, that they would be created a lot more often and a lot bigger in cosmic radiation hitting anything that's in their way. So if neutron stars exist, then we can safely assume that microscopic black holes, if they existed, were not stable. Because otherwise they'd be eaten up the moment they existed by something that hits them. I heard there was a Does, guy in Hawaii. Has anyone ever heard about Rick? Rick used to be a heavy ion, is still a heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National yeah. Lab on Long Island um, in the 90s, I think, when it ramped up the star experiment, there were, was a rumor that they would create black holes and destroy the universe. I think the rumor about the black holes came up ever since someone fancied a theory that would contain black holes, because black holes are cute. <laughs> but the problem is, the moment someone comes up with a cute idea that sounds kind of vicious, 
someone else comes up and and goes to an American lawyer and says, "I want to get money for this." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is mostly how it works. People are more easily scared than assured of of being safe, and that's that's the big deal. That's why we actually have to take care of publishing results of of like the way we communicate with general public, because general public tends to receive the negative message much better than the positive message. That having been said, there are analyses that are searching for black holes. I mean, we're looking for them. I wish we had found them, but we haven't, yeah. The beam itself can kind of slide We tried. <laughs> no, so the, the, the question was about beam safety. So we've done... <laughs> to be very clear so about the bread. Yeah. Let's, let's be clear. No, you cannot slice bread with it. You can melt. Yeah. It you would can be like melt a cubic meter of copper with the energy that's within the beam. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, you can you can cut the bread with it, but you'd have to get the beam to the bread. Um, we did test studies with copper, and we can shoot very nice holes into copper. Um, when when we're talking about beam safety, we have two so-called beam dumps, one for each direction, which are sitting in point six of the LHC. That's somewhat pointing towards Zurich <laughs> on that ring. No, but the, but the pointing direction then is towards the UK and towards Italy. So they're sitting on the side of Zurich of the ring, but pointing in different directions. Um, beam dumps are basically a larger structure that can be cooled, that heats up to 700 degrees Celsius if you dump the beam into it, which are there for safety. So if we have the full LHC filled with protons, we're talking about 2,808 packages per direction with about 100 billion to 200 billion protons inside. The protons themselves don't have much energy as such, but there's just so many of them that it makes for a large impact. When we for any reason, which we do very often, because every now and then we have electric glitches or whatever, dump the beam, we realize there's something wrong with the machine, so we are not sure we can keep the beam in shape. In that moment, it takes three turns of the protons to dump them into the beam dump. Three turns is less than a millisecond, and the time constant that all the magnets have that we have there, we, we have the largest magnets that you can find in the world. Magnets tend to be slow in whatever they do. We pump them up with, what, 8 kiloamps, 10 kiloamps. So yeah. the, mo the time it takes for this current to go down, and if the current goes down, the magnetic field itself induces more current as it coll collapses. So the time constant of these magnets is so large that within their time constants, if we would just cut the wire between one end and the other and the current could not flow, A, the current would continue to flow wherever it can, and B, the magnetic field would still be there for a while. And this while is long enough that we can dump the beam. Um, we have to defocus the beam. We have to shoot the packages into different directions in the beam dump so as to not shoot holes into the beam dump. But yes, the beam itself is not a very nice thing. No one is underground when this happens. We have interlocked doors everywhere. So if anyone, for any reason, manages to open a door um, that will cause the beam to be dumped, and those doors are either above surface or at least like six meters of concrete away from the actual beam line. Yeah, yeah we, we do shoot holes into stuff. I have no idea. The beam dump itself is a structure that's like 10 meters long or so, so as to, as to be safe. It's roughly it's analogous to shooting a bolt of lightning into something. That gives you an idea. It's a lot of We're, we're lot talking of power, about 1,800 yeah. megajoule, if, if anyone wants to do the calculations. I'm not very good at calculus. <laughs> Thinking about the uh, other, maybe sort of slightly off topic here, uh, faster light. Yeah. Ah, right. <laughs> faster than light neutrinos. Whoa. What was the, what was the problem? Oh. Um, so uh, maybe just I, I, Sadly, I don't have a picture of C and GS. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so the neutrinos, just a, a brief word on neutrinos, the faster than light neutrinos. So what is a neutrino? A neutrino is just a fundamental particle. It's very light. It's almost impossible to detect. We need dedicated detectors to do it. Atlas can't see them. Um, and so that's why 
you remember at the very beginning, WW was so hard was because we can't see the neutrinos coming out of there. Um, but we have dedicated experiments where we make neutrino beams at CERN and, uh, and elsewhere, but the one in question came from CERN. And then we shot it through the ground at Grand, to Grand Sasso Laboratory in Italy. And what you do is you basically make measurements on the beam at CERN, and at Grand Sasso you look for changes in the composition of the beam between the two points. And so a sort of a warm-up measurement um, that they did on this uh, experiment was they tried to measure just the time of flight of the neutrinos. And, and they came up with a number that said the neutrinos were traveling faster than the speed of light, which is, um, which is something that Einstein might disagree with. And, um, and it, it was actually, it was an interesting case um, because they were very, as, as it turns out, um, the reason that they measured that was because there was a problem, there was a loose cable in their data acquisition system. And so there was a signal that was traveling through their, um, through basically their electronics crates a little bit slower than they had calibrated it to travel. And this ended up looking like a delay that the implication was that the neutrinos looked like they were traveling faster than the speed of light. So, so after a couple of months of, of very thorough and nervous investigation, they found, they found this problem, they reran the analysis, the neutrinos do not travel faster than the speed of light. It was a really interesting case, though, that in particular, um, because I, I really, uh, so the, the collaboration that did this was the OPERA collaboration. And, um, and there was a lot of criticism of, of opera at the time that they were irresponsible for giving this result. Um, and, and I personally, at least, um, I, everyone has an opinion on this, but I personally at least really admired what they did there because it was a tricky, uh, it was a tricky result um, that, that you, you put yourself in their position, like you've done this analysis, you've checked everything you can think of to check. Okay, maybe you didn't check your cables, but I, that wouldn't be the first thing that I would think of either. Um, and, and you still have the result, and like, what, what are you supposed to, you can't not release it, um, because, you know, it, and I don't know, maybe neutrinos do travel faster than the speed of light. Um, and, and you would feel like a fool if you figured this out in six months and you were sitting on it and then someone else scooped the Nobel Prize from you in the meantime. Um, and so I, if you look back at the result as they presented it, I, I thought they did it in a, a quite a responsible way in the sense that they, they went forward, they said, look, this is what we find doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. These are all the things we've checked, and it's not any of those. So we said we would give you a result. This is our result. Um, and, and very pointedly not saying we think travel, neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light. And so it was, it was kind of interesting then to watch uh, both the experimental community trying to figure out what's wrong with it, and the theoretical community is like, ooh, neutrinos can travel faster than the speed of light than like, and, you know, and like traveling this and following this, this through their favorite theory and, I don't know, coming up with like extra dimensions out of it or something like that. <laughs> what <laughs> what people should understand here is what is seen on the map now. Um, what we're doing yeah. is we're taking protons from the pre-accelerator of the LHC, shoot it into a target where they convert into muons, and then we detect yeah. muons in two places. And as the muons disappear from one place to another, we know that they must have left a muon neutrino behind. That's the way our physics works. That's the way we can explain a lot of things. So there must be a muon neutrino whenever a muon disappeared. So at that point, we can say we've produced so many muon neutrinos in this type of distance. And then we shoot them through three, 738 kilometers of rock. And we hit our target, the opera detector, close to Rome in the Gran Sasso underground laboratory with about two centimeters of precision. And they've measured the timing of both the incident beam at CERN and the arrival at uh, Gran Sasso to a little less than a na two nanoseconds accuracy. Which is two they feet have, at they the have, speed of light. They have GPS receivers, which they have to install above surface to get this timing. And then they have to extrapolate at CERN 100 meters underground and at Gran Sasso uh, through the Gran Sasso tunnel. So they actually, actually they have to block half of the tunnel. It has two lanes, and they block one of those lanes for quite some time just to extrapolate length me measurements from the outside to the inside and get the timing right at the detector. So measuring a 60 nanosecond time difference in time of arrival is complicated. And I think they've put a lot of effort into this. So yeah. um, I think I saw you had a question. Or from a blog, perhaps it runs with it and applies some sweeping generalizations. 
Uh, Are we talking about God particles? Oh, yeah. So yeah, the question God is particle. about media and how how we get around with them. I guess. <laughs> um, I, so I guess my opinion, it depends very much, I, I guess, my opinion uh, on how responsibly I feel like the message has been conveyed. Um, so one example that I'll give is uh, that outlets like the BBC or the New York Times, usually they have people who, when they come to us, are very responsible about trying to portray things accurately. And sometimes it's not perfect, but, you know, um, that's that's all right with me. I'm less crazy about um, sometimes bloggers feel a little bit more, um, take a little bit more liberty than I would have chosen. I think that um, it certainly gets people interested in talking, and I think that that is a good thing. Um, but, for example, when there was this sort of spurious semi-discovery in 2011. The reason that was a problem was because it got onto a blog and it got public. And so that's an example of how it, I think it kind of hurt us to have something out there, but then have to say like, no, 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 don't pay attention to that. Um, and then, and then I guess on the very far extreme are kind of like crackpots. And I guess, what can you do with people are going to say what they're going to say about that whatever. Handing the question back, how does Google deal with it? <laughs> There was a question there. So when LHC was first supposed to go online back in 2007 or 2008, there were some Here's a question about the LHC accident in 2008. What accident? So the I'm accident. Kidding. I'm just kidding. I know we what only, accident. We only had one. Um, so to, to, again, to talk in numbers, we have 1,232 dipole magnets, which are in most places connected to one another. We're filling this full 27 kilometer ring with magnets or accelerating structure or experiments, but that's that's all there is. And we only have so many. Uh, when this accident happened, what happened was there's an interconnection between multiple magnets. Those are superconducting magnets. They run at a typical temperature of like 1.9 Kelvin. We're cooling them with what we call superfluid helium, which tends to crawl up the wall and cover all surfaces and has, as far as we can measure, infinite heat conductivity, kind of, um, which is complicated to measure at almost absolute zero. Um, so we're cooling this all so far just because we need the coolant flow, because helium itself doesn't have a large heat capacity, so we need superfluid helium to get there. Um, problem is gases tend to uh, expand, well, liquid gases tend to expand as they evaporate by about a factor of 1,000, which is kind of old, almost always true. So depending on which gas you have, that's more or less, but like a factor of 1,000 is a good number. Um, what happened there was that we had an interconnection between two superconductors, which was slightly above the resistance that it should have been, plus that the heat conduction at this place was slightly below the value that it should have been. So unfortunate, but what happened was that the, uh, it's not that simple, there's someone making an extending movement in the background. <laughs> um, what happened was this thing got hot. Um, it kind of burned through, so the superconductor didn't work anymore because it was too warm. So at that point, the typical superconductor that we use is niobium titanium. And niobium and titanium are both not very good conductors. It's a wonderful superconductor, up to 10 Kelvin, but as soon as it goes beyond that, gone. So what happened was the current, those 8 kiloamps or so, had to go somewhere else. And typically what we have for this is a copper, copper surrounding. So like two U profiles that slide on top of one another. So if the magnets extend or shrink, they can still have contact. And if the current goes through the copper, then at least it can still continue and you immediately dump the power of the magnet. Problem was in this case, even the copper contact wasn't there. So what then happened, like tiny gap. So the current goes somewhere else. And what it did was it jumped a little and hit the helium vessel within the magnet. So the helium and the superconductor are not within the same structure, but they're connected through metal. Um, what then happened was the helium vessel opened, the helium sees a sudden under pressure and starts evaporating, getting hot and creating a cloud. And this then pushed partially the magnets by one and a half meters. Um, each of those magnets is about 20 meters long and about 22 tons in weight and they're bolted into concrete feet 
with, with screws roughly the size of my arm. And that so is why you're not allowed that, in the cavern when the beam is running. That, that is why we have interlocked doors. Yeah. Um, it moved a total of 55 magnets at the time, which is a long distance. Like a total of 400 meters, I think, was damaged. And it took a year to fix it and get first um, countermeasures installed. And right now we're in a shutdown because we want to install more countermeasures to this. Because we are kind of sure that we've, we've pinpointed the problematic locations. And we're trying to measure, like you can, you can try and go online and figure out how to measure a resistance of less than a nanoamp. That's, that's complicated. Um, we've been managing to measure that. And uh, the idea is now to either exchange magnets where we think that the resistances are too high in these junction points, or also install overpressure valves. Because the moment this just happens again, we need to be prepared that there's helium again extending and expanding and moving the magnets. And that would be sad. So that's what we're doing right now. How do you test the, how do you, how do you, I mean, Come to CERN. Here's the question of how do we test this? This is all prototype. Like we're we're not building a sec we're not building a second LHC. So the first time we switch this on is the first time ever someone's trying this, and we're only switching on the real machine. We don't have a second one somewhere in the backyard where we can try out stuff. So this is our one playground. Uh, that is why things like this happen, and they have to happen to figure out why why stuff is not working. Um, we do have above surface structures where we also have superfluid helium to operate the magnets, but you can only operate so many in a chain because you need the space. So getting all of this assembled in a really large structure only happens underground. We're, we only have one system and that's the production system. There, there is, there's a pre-production sample, but it never gives you the full feeling. It's like just having the engine of a Ferrari and then trying to figure out how it will drive. Yeah. This is a question here. Good question, in particular for the LHC. Yeah. I can tell you that for detectors, the oh, the question was uh, how many rounds of design reviews do we do? Um, so I can tell you that from the detector side of things. Um, the technical design report for the detector I worked on was written in 1998. The last changes to that were made, I think, in 2007, probably, just before we installed. Because what we did was we installed an additional heater blanket or components that couldn't be operated very cold. Um, that was the last design change that was made. Um, I don't think there's ever been a state at which the detector was clearly defined up until the point where we installed it. Um, we do go through a lot of rounds of design reviews because we're never sure, like, did we see everything? So we have a lot of people from, for example, other experiments. We can just go around and, like, pick up people from Alice or from LHCB and tell them, here, look, this is what we're going to build. Is this sane? Go through the documentation, go through the pre-production samples that we have, like, figure out whether we overlooked something. How many specializations um, That depends on the project. I mean, for me, it's typically electrical engineering. So um, there's electrical engineers, there's physicists who want to figure out whether, besides the technical aspect, the thing still works for a physicist. Because you, you will find that the, there's a big difference between the electrical engineer and the physicist in approach of trying to build a detector. Um, that's mostly it, I think. It depends on the problem. Like, we have IT specialists there. We have kind of specialists for everything there. We have our own department for glues. We have five more minutes, two or three questions. There's one over there. Question is how reliable is the machine now? In last year, last year's operation was on time of, I don't know, we had a so-called Hübner factor of more than 40%, I think. Yeah, I think I, when it's running really well, the, it t it's a little bit stop and go at the beginning as they sort of get a feel for the machine. Once it's sort of on that plateau, though, um, it's running maybe 70% of the time. And then the rest of the time, you're refilling or calibrating, so the, whatever. Once yeah. the machine is on, it really operates 24-7 and nicely, actually. 
Yeah. Like the all the data we've acquired last year, it was more than we initially were told we would get, and it was definitely very good. Question there. I, I, sh I sure hope that Katie's going to answer the um, question. I will, what's, I will try. It's, what's what's the gaps in the standard model? Like, what do we do now that we have the Higgs on? Um, so we're looking for, there's a large class of people who are looking for supersymmetry, which is another sort of, you take the standard model and you give it another sort of dimension of freedom, if you like. Um, and this gives you a whole new set of particles that we can be looking for that might have escaped our attention so far because we didn't have the energy to see them or because they don't interact with uh, the part, like the protons and, and the atoms that we make our detector out of, so maybe they sneak through because we just they don't interact with atoms that well. Um, so there's a large group that's looking for that. Um, other open questions that are related, uh, I think, are things like uh, searching for dark matter, uh, which is something that we know cosmologically has to exist because we look out there and we see the 25% of the universe is something that we can't see. Um, and so some of the super, uh, super symmetric theories in particular have particles that are candidates to be the dark matter particles. So we look for those. Um, there are some other exotic searches that happen at the LHC uh, for things like magnetic monopoles, extra dimensions, black holes. Um, and then, yeah, like the, the other little things. Yeah. Um, and then the, there's some other uh, smaller experiments that you don't hear coming out of CERN as much, but I think are maybe in the long run more impactful on people's lives. So things like uh, learning how to make anti-hydrogen and to trap it and to study its spectrum um, and uh, things like that, that potentially like anti-hydrogen, as, as it turns out, and anti-protons are really, have some really nice properties if you want to fight cancer. As it happens, they're extremely difficult to make um, and they're extremely difficult, they're not well studied at all. Um, we only, the first time we ever made anti-hydrogen was in 1996. So this is, this is not a new, this is not an old thing. This is something that like, we're really like pushing on the edge of there. But if, if they figure out how to make it in larger quantities, then there's all kinds of cool stuff you could do with, with something like antimatter, for example. Um, the, the general oh, drive is to kind of get the full picture of the universe. So if we're looking up into the sky and we see that like 97% of whatever is out there is not what we understand in our current models, then we're upset. <laughs> right. We, we, as much as possible, interconnect the two as much as we can, though. But then we, we also have colleagues in things like astrophysics who can help us, too. And then that can How long does it take to build the beam something in the uh, Do you want to take this? The uh, question is how long does it take to fill? Uh, about half an hour. So. The filling procedure itself, depending on how stable it goes, is something like 10 to 15 minutes to get lots of packets of protons into the ring, because you need to like stagger it. So you, you start at a very small ring accelerator, accelerate protons to a medium energy, get them into the next accelerator, higher energy, and then eventually fill them into the LHC. But that these, as these rings have different radii, you can fill only so many packages into each ring. And so the initial ring gives you the maximum length that you can fill into the next ring. And as we do this, the procedure has to repeat a lot of times before we completely fill the LHC. So that takes 10 to 15 minutes. And then the ramp up of energy that happens in the LHC takes another, let's say, 10 to 15 yeah, minutes. 20 yeah. minutes, maybe. So if it runs, um, the acceler well, let's say the energy itself in the LHC doesn't actually cause any energy consumption because the magnets are superconducting. So you only fill them with current, and you can actually withdraw the current eventually. Like, you, you could get it back. I don't think we do. Um, the energy consumption initially, I don't know. CERN has a proper power line. So we we get this these days. These, like, we, we have problems when we switch from the Swench, French to the Swiss network, which is, which is an 18 kilovolt line on one side and an 18 kilovolt line on the other side. And in theory, this should happen seamlessly. It never does. Like whenever we are being told that there's a switching of power, then everyone shuts down all the critical systems because it means less work when you power them up again. Um, we have a maximum of 200 megawatts that we can consume in standard operation with the LHC on. 
we're consuming between 145 and 165 megawatts, out of which 85 is just the cooling system for the LHC. Um, our F power to keep the protons at energy is 2.4 megawatts. So that's where we're talking order of the canton of Geneva in terms of power consumption. That's 400,000 households. This is why we're supposed to switch off in winter, because if we're drawing too much car in Geneva, has trouble with heating. Yeah, we can take a message, like outside. Yeah, I know there's a lot more questions, but uh, I'll guess we have some meetings set up, one starting in two minutes. So, um, yeah, I think. Thank you very much for having us. Having yeah, us good here, questions. Yeah. Good questions.